So in our discussion of caring for the poor, we focused on an ethical issue which is non-negotiable in scripture. You can't look at scripture and say there's no call to Christians to care to the poor. Our question then was how? What does caring for the poor look like and how much is demanded of us? In the ethical issue for this last session, we're going to look at a different type of question. We're going to look at the issue of war and pacifism. And this is, in a certain sense, um, more complicated than our discussion of care of the poor because there isn't a clear statement as to whether or not Christians can engage in warfare or are required to be pacifist. And let's take this further, as the Anscombe article does. Can Christians ever use violence? How do we think about this? This is difficult because there isn't a clear continued tradition of scriptural discussion on this question. And that has led to a pretty dramatic shift within Christianity in how we talk about this and how we understand the role of Christians using violence and in warfare. So rather than asking how, we have to ask, can we do it? And so it becomes a really important space for ethical reflection. So I've given you um, a really insightful essay by Elizabeth Anscombe, the great uh, British philosopher from the mid 20th centuries, uh, one of Wittgenstein's students, um, and one of the great early kind of retrievals of, Th of Thomas and analytic philosophy. And Anscombe does a really good job teaching us how reflecting on these ethical questions requires clarity of what we're talking about. And I think this is important to stop and say, what do our words mean when we talk about any of these issues? Because all of our words carry a valence that we might think we know what we're talking about, other people may not, may have radically different assumptions. In addition, the Anscombe article provides a sophisticated engagement with scripture, with the tradition, and with the type of moral analytic reasoning we talked about when we talked about the nature of the moral act. She provides a in addition, sort of a little thumbnail sketch of a lot of the arguments around just war and pacifism at her time, which was, um, I believe this was written right after the Second World War. And so I think it's important to get these, artic these arguments out. The other two articles are really interesting because they show a dialogue between Richard Hayes, who we've already encountered, and Nigel Biggers, who is the current Regis Professor of Moral Theology at Oxford and also an Anglican priest on these issues. And in the Biggers and Hayes debate, we see not only arguments about using scripture, but also what happens when we have a contest between different traditions. And here's what I mean by this. In the Christian tradition, looking historically, we can see not a continual thread, let's not say that, but there's often been a conflict. You, you can appeal to the tradition and go both ways um, as you're making these arguments. And so what Hayes is representing is the Anabaptist pacifist tradition. And just to sketch this out in a thumbnail for you, it is indisputable historically that in the early church, um, particularly, let's say, the first, after the first couple of generations, there were, Christians were, if not pacifist, at least deeply concerned about Christians engaging in warfare. We know that there were Christian soldiers. We also know that the church's penitential practices around anybody engaged in an act of violence 
right? Anybody who had served in warfare were strict and rigorous so that a person who had been a soldier was required to do penitence for years upon return before being readmitted into the Eucharistic Fellowship of the Church. So there was a real sense that at the very least there was a problem in saying one could be both a soldier for Christ and a soldier serving in the Roman armies. So then comes along Constantine and the connection between the Christian church and the Roman Empire. And at first, there was a real sense, and this is articulated by historians such as Eusebius, that the Roman Empire becoming a Christian nation was the beginning and the culmination of Christ's kingdom. Um, an esca a very imminent eschatological eschatology that God's kingdom must be coming about here on earth when you have a Christian conquering in the sign of the cross. This euphoric read on Constantine, um, sorry, I don't mean Eusebius, I mean Lactantius. This, is, this read was countered by theologians such as Augustine who saw in the Roman Empire not the coming of the kingdom of Christ, but rather even in the Christian Roman Empire, a continuance of all of the sins of the pagan Roman Empire. And this wasn't about idolatry as much as it was about pride and a conviction that a conflation of the earthly empire and God's kingdom. And this is what we get in such famous passages as Book 19 of the City of God. Um, of course, the skepticism is advanced even more by the fact that the Roman Empire started to fall and that a lot of people blamed the Christians for this. And so there was a real need and said, oh, well, if the empire, emperor hadn't become Christian, then this wouldn't happen. So in the West, where the Roman Empire collapsed, not in the East, which is a very different situation, the empire continued um, out of Constantinople for centuries and centuries and centuries, and this tight connection between the church and the empire continued. Um, in the West, Christian theologians had to engage in this justification that it wasn't Christianity that caused the fall of the empire. It was these sins that were already baked into the imperial structure. And so we begin to see this challenging dance between the church and the society. And this continues in, the, in Western Europe through the fragmentation of the Roman Empire, um, in which you have these kings from barbarian countries who are converting, who want to use being Christian to be kind of a sign that they've received the mantle of the Roman Empire and the church's struggles to survive and to exert some type of moral control over these kings without being co-opted. And what we see developing is a, we, we could even call it a code of warfare, a sense of what does it look like to fight under the banner of Christ, not spiritually, but also physically. Of course, this culminates in the Crusades, um, and specifically in the peninsula, the Span the Iberian Peninsula, in the struggles between the, the Moors and the Christians and going to Jerusalem, and in the definition and the limitations on warfare. So the fact that you couldn't fight on, pre on feast days puts a check on warfare. The fact that... Um, there were limitations what you could do on the battlefield puts a check on warfare. The direction of kind of the warring spirit to recovering Jerusalem, recovering the Holy Land, puts a check on warfare. And this develops in two different ways. On one hand, after the Reformation, we have this 
return, radical return to scripture alone that we saw when we read the Shlaitheim Confession among the Anabaptists. There is a narrative, and this continues to this day, that the conflation of God's kingdom with the, with the earthly kingdom is contrary to scripture, that the community of believers needs to not be complicit in the governing society, but needs to be separate to pursue a life of holiness without all the distractions of the outside world. Um, and that this is what we're supposed to do. Again, like we saw this in the Shaitan Confession, and that there was a sellout at the time of Constantine that really the church didn't recover from until after the Reformation. And the fact that a lot of Christians spent a lot of time trying to kill Anabaptists, there was huge persecution of the Anabaptists during the Reformation, did um, felt, felt like further confirmation of this narrative, this sense of the holy city being attacked on the outside and that they needed to be divided. And of course, the strongest example of this is we could see an Amish or Mennonites who completely would draw, but following, let's say the first, kind of around the time of the First World War, um, in reaction to the horrors of modern warfare that were revealed for the first time in the First World War, going up through World War II, and then continuing into the present day, this pacifist strand from the Anabaptist tradition has exerted a very powerful pull on Christian ethics. Um, Stanley Hauerwas and kind of those at Duke, such as Richard Hayes, being great examples of folks who have really read scripture to say, this is an important strand that needs to be brought back into the mainstream of Christian thought. The other development, like I said, there's a sense of the church trying to moderate warfare by properly directing and putting limits. Developed further through the thought of Thomas Aquinas, the engagement of theologians in the later scholastics, such as the School of Salamanca, into an articulation of rules of warfare. And this means not only how do you conduct yourself in war, but what are the correct reasons to have war, an idea of a just war, that you can fight, but it is only for a just cause. And so the job of the church isn't to say don't ever fight, but to clearly articulate when it is appropriate to fight. And after the second war, during the kind of contempt modern warfare, um, and particularly the development of technologies such as, um, you know, air bombing, nuclear warfare, um, the focus in this strand, the just war tradition, has been much more on how do we determine when it is acceptable to fight. And Anscombe talks about this quite a bit, um, which has, interestingly enough, result been increasingly narrowed in much of the tradition. And I think a lot of this is in reaction to modern warfare technology. Um, so we have these two strands, the just warriors and the pacifist in dialogue with each other, a narrowing of the just war provisions or uh, of just war theory and an expansion of this Anabaptist approach into more of the theological mainstream. And this really comes out in this dialogue that Biggers and Hayes are having. Um, and so we'll, we'll spend more time kind of outlining those positions, but I wanted you to have historical background first.